What we're talking about today are a number of the sources of frustration, anxiety, disappointment in the healthcare system that a dispute resolution lens or a conflict engagement lens might provide a more satisfying system overall. So we have three fantastic panelists this morning. Um, oh, I guess this afternoon, now that I'm thinking about that. The first one we have is Michael Giordano, um, sitting here just to, I guess, my left, your left as well. Okay. Um, MD, JD, MBA. What else do I need to say about this guy? So he's a neuroscientist. He's a, he's a neurosurgeon. He loves school. He loves school. Um, but one of the things, when we were looking for um, sort of uh, finding folks for this panel, we were actually thinking in terms of the number of levels of <coughs> conflict engagement that Deb talked about this morning. And so Mike is very much a specialist on the interpersonal component here. He's currently representing patients in medical malpractice cases against physicians. Again, he's also a former recovering, or perhaps still, neurosurgeon. Um, so has very much been on both sides, is very sen sensitive to and cognizant of the challenges that physicians face in this system. And so he's very much looking at the interpersonal aspect of these unexpected outcomes, and so dealing with the patient-provider relationship. To Michael's left, you're right, I think. We have Lita Orofice, um, who will be our third speaker this morning. But Lita is coming in from the patient society relationship because of her extensive experience doing governmental policy work, both in Providence and Washington, D.C., and really trying to think through the appropriate and best use of governmental <coughs> tools in improving and shaping our healthcare system. And then all the way to your right, we have Susan Senecal, who joins us from Albany, really talking to us about the patient organization level. She's had tremendous in insight and experience in trying to use these types of, this kind, type of conflict engagement tool to improve the healthcare systems in which she works so that this kind of conversation not only informs and heals the relationship between providers and patients, but also allows healthcare systems to improve the system in which this care is provided so that ideally we're able to get all of the priorities aligned for better patient care and, um, and quality patient safety. So with that, I will turn it over first to Dr. Giordano to provide his thoughts on this morning's case. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Hi, everybody. I think what I'll do is uh, kind of go through the case, um, maybe answer, give my perspective on some of these questions that Jennifer put here. Um, so you've heard the case. I'm not going to go over it again. This is a screening thing that everyone should have at age 50 uh, because this is such a common cancer, and this is a screenable cancer that can be cured before it gets to your lymph nodes or farther, then you're in some serious trouble. So clearly this this guy wasn't a screen, he's diagnostic with all the money as aspects of it, uh, needed to have this done more, more or less. Now, was he told about other things? I mean, there's a CT scan, a special kind that you can do now. Not a lot of the payers, I think, are paying for it yet, but it's not invasive at all and you can get somewhat the same information. But you can't biopsy. You can't do anything in, inside like you can with a, a scope. So I'm not sure he was told about that or barium enema and things. Um, but, but really, the standard of care now today is just there's problems in the colon, even diverticula, di you, you really need to make screen out cancer. So I, I think that, you know, the doctor may have touched on those, but maybe not. Which brings you to the confirmation bias that I would say, you know, patients have. They first want to believe that their doctor is the best. I mean, when have any of you said to somebody, oh, my doctor's the worst, but I'm going to still go to him. If I, if I had a nickel for every patient and told me, you know, oh my God, my doctor's the best, and I'd be, I'd be rich. So we want to believe that we have a great doctor because we don't want somebody who's, who's bad doing things to us. So they've already, on the side of whatever the doctor says, 
more or less they're going to do when we talk about the consent today you know they're they're going to often say you know what do you what would you do and you're going to tell them and they're going to do it you know they're going to have this procedure done so um what i'd say about this and this will tie into the medical mal stuff which is the best thing for me to talk about with you so they say it's assuming medical error um which in fact with the let's say he's not a guy with a complication rate you were saying if he's an average guy this is likely not an error the, di the di diverticula are, are friable meaning that they're prone to break and things like that so the colon can perforate and it's not good because peritonitis is one of the things that can happen and peritonitis can go into sepsis which you can die so it's a very serious com it's a complication like this shows you he had a lot of intensive care time, huge bills that would come from that, um, and, and very ill. And then later on down the road, he could have scar tissue in there, more problems the rest of his life. So it's a big deal. But let's just say, for uh, you know, for the case, it is medical error. So he's done some substandard act. So here's a case that would come to my office, and I see a lot of these types of cases. People call up. This exact same thing happened, or there's a death. A lot of them are dead. And, you know, they're like, I want to sue. And this one gets rejected right on the front end, risk of procedure. You, you, you just don't win as a plaintiff's lawyer if it's a risk. You know, and this is a known risk of this type of, you know, uh, intervention. So they go away with nothing. And yet, we know it was a substandard act the first part of the uh, tort of uh, negligence, right? There's a substandard act, you know, it ended up causing the peritonitis which killed the patient or here made him extremely sick and caused these giant bills. But you'll never be able to prove that it's a substandard act if it's a risk of procedure. So what does that person do? I mean, I, I think that there should be some type of dispute resolution process where this person could get compensated outside of the civil <clears throat> litigation. The civil litigation is expensive. The even worse case than risk of procedure is a case I see, I just saw one yesterday, where the doctor, <clears throat> you know, does a sub substandard act. It actually caused the problems. She has damages, but she's doing pretty well now. And at the end of the day, the only thing that she's out is uh, maybe three months of salary. And, um, you know, the time she spent in the hospital, maybe co-pays and things, but never going to be worth the firm's money to litigate. Really not even worth her time with all the depositions and stuff you have to go through in this imperfect method that we have. And those are hard conversations to have. I had one guy lost an entire finger. Easy standard of care, easy causation, lost his finger. It was a commercial diver, non-dominant hand. Are you still working? Had been a year. Oh yeah, I'm working. Does it affect your ability to work? Oh no, I'm fine. Your finger's not worth litigating. It's missing a whole finger. Isn't there some way that you could, you know, compensate this guy, you know, for a totally negligent care? that caused this to happen. And actually this guy could have died because the infection started to spread. He was smart enough to go to somebody else who went, oh my God, I gotta cut off your finger. You know, to save your life, basically. So anyway, um, on the med on the med mal end, when I was practicing neuro neurosurgery, one of the highest risk things to do, I had this perception of the evil lawyers on every corner could sue me. Now I'm on the other side. It's very hard to sue a doctor and win. And the percentages, you know, will show you that. I think nationwide, 80% defense verdicts. You know, in a firm that's specialized, and of course you've got better numbers than that, you'd be out of business. But, but doctors don't even conceive of how hard it is for a lawyer to bring a case. It has to be very clear. Negligence and causation is always the most difficult part of the case because there's several other reasons why this might have happened that the defense people who are quite smart will throw out there. It'll just confuse the jury, jury if it ever gets to that point. 
still likes doctors most of the time. They'll give him the benefit of the doubt. You know, on the more likely than not standard, he wins. So that's what I'd say about medical malpractice. Um, kind of on some of the things that Jennifer talked about. So say this is a guy who's, you know, seven out of ten of his cases, something horrible happens. This is a terrible practitioner. He should not be doing this procedure or maybe not even practice medicine. The only place that you can go with that, unless there's a clear med mal type of thing, is the Department of Public Health. You know, and oftentimes I say to the people that come to the office, I sometimes call them patients, clients, patients, paralegals, PAs, I, I switch them around all the time. But I, it's terrible. But um, they'll come and they'll have a pretty clean case, but again, say not worth enough, enough money, or such a substandard act that I know in my heart it caused a problem, but I couldn't prove it because there's too much other things that complicate the causation part of the tort. I I'll just say call it DPH. You know, that's a good place to go. The doctor's a jerk. He's not, he's, he, he, he's not good. It, it needs to go to the DPH. But if enough people don't do that against this guy, it's never going to be a flag for them to pursue. You know, they'll investigate each time there's a claim, and some of their, inve and their investigations are quite thorough. Anyway, um, just a food for thought. It's about the only other place you can go right now with no ADR system in place for medical error. That's about all i got to say. Hi. First of all, thank you for asking me to come tonight. I'm so happy to be here. Um, I haven't been in this arena for a little while, um, having worked in New York for three years with three large hospitals there on medical um, liability reform. So this is a real treat for me. And this morning was just wonderful listening to Deb. I could see all the light bulbs going on in my head and hope to um, illuminate some of them for you. Um, I wanted to put this in the context of what I did in New York and basically the three um, parts of this that we looked at and from the organizational perspective, there is the preventative cause, the, the patient safety aspect of all of this care. Um, there is the, on the right hand side, the once you've already had an error and you know that there's cause and you know that it was either negligent and, and not defensible, um, we did judge directed negotiations or mediation. It's this middle part that we're talking about today, this gray area with the colonoscopy where mistakes do happen. We are all human, there is human error. No one is perfect and the expectation that we have perfection is not reasonable. And so then you start talking about the reasonableness of care and that's what we're looking at for this gentleman who underwent the colonoscopy. So from a systems perspective, what we do first and foremost is look at the competency of the practitioners, as you're, uh, as you're probably aware. When I speak with healthcare folks, they're pretty um, aware of credentialing and privileging and things like that. Where it gets difficult, though, is there's not a lot of data for that. When you talk about this benchmark of 0.08% being the um, rate with which colonoscopies perforate, um, that assumes that you've looked at a lot of data and have that information. But more importantly to practitioners and to hospital systems as well is the um, risk-adjusted data. You know, what you will hear constantly from a provider is my patient's, um, this patient, was at a higher risk. So it's not 0.08%. Uh, but is that the important part? So for us as a healthcare organization and for anyone, it's really looking at your network. Um, the gentleman this morning that talked a little bit about the ACO, that's going to become more and more important, not for cost, but for the quality and the proficiency and the competency of the practitioners that we select in our network. Um, the next part that we look at is uh, and when I worked uh, with Rick Boothman, I guess this is the part for me that was the aha experience. And once you start doing this, it's very difficult to go back. Um, did we do the right thing? And people are afraid, uh, practitioners are afraid um, of being sued. Um, hospitals are afraid of opening the floodgate to claims that come in. So for us to admit to this gentleman that we made a mistake, and you're right, you have a lot of expenses, and we should absorb those expenses, um, that's where everyone becomes afraid as well. What does that mean for all of the rest of the people that then have these errors, these human errors? Whose responsibility is it to assume the risk for error? And th what's the cost bearing for that? 
um, we touched a little bit on that this morning as well, you know, where the wealthy can then afford um, the risk, can afford to go out of network perhaps. Um, that's a societal question that doesn't have an answer yet, but certainly to pose something to pose for the future. When I say you can't go back, it's very difficult now when I'm in the position that I'm in with the front line and the family is to sit down and say to them, there's the dance that occurs that you're all aware of um, between the legal system and the physicians and the healthcare system of what do you say, what are you allowed to say to the patients. There are still systems, and in fact right now, and I can tell you I, I've worked in one of them, where risk management does not speak to patients. We're not allowed to talk to the family. And once something happens, everyone's afraid. Um, they're afraid they're, they're going to be held accountable for what they say in the moment of, I'm sorry this happened to you. I mean, to the point where in New York State we don't have apology laws, so people won't say they're sorry, even though it's a terrible case and you want to empathize as a human but the physician doesn't have apology laws. So he's not allowed by his representation to say, I'm so sorry this happened to you. Um, that's one aspect. So when we go forward, and when I worked with Rick especially, to sit across from a patient's family and feel that your hands are tied and your lips are sealed to talk about what happened, that's the difficulty that we're in now. These are some of the questions we have to raise as we go forward. I've sat with families and many times they just want to know the truth. They know when you're not talking about the truth. But the organization and the provider are so afraid to provide the truth for fear that they will then be taken out of context and hung out to dry. So for human error, for things that happen because we're not perfect, um, it's, a, it's, it's a difficult situation for providers, for physicians in this room. I know that you've been in that position probably once or twice in your life. If you haven't, you will be. Um, and for the attorneys that know as well that something's happened not to be able to get their clients um, the answers that they anticipate or expect. I'll leave you with the one thing that um, I really I learned today and I'll take it forward. I always like to learn something where I go. When Deb talked about opening um, engagement, uh, the conflict, not resolution, but the conflict engagement, um, this was a gift I'm taking home with me. <coughs> to the provider, to the doctor who's asked, doctor, what would you do? We are so fast to try and answer a question. We don't reflect on it. The perfect question I learned from Deb was, what, it, what are you afraid of? That would have been my question. Not what would I have done, what would my mother have done, but I would have asked the person, what is it that you're afraid of if you have this done? So it's not about what I want to do, but what, what can I do to make you comfortable with what you want to do? Um, maybe that uh, patient will say to you, well, gee, my daughter's getting married in three months, and if I'm sick for that, I won't get to be there. Can we wait until after that? Maybe that's the question that they wanted answered. So instead of being so quick to answer, try and listen, try and ask the questions, because a lot of times in the conflict, the informed consent, whether I know what I'm doing, do they really know what could happen? That engagement, that conversation will oftentimes solve those questions. Those are what I have to leave you with today, and I, I guess we'll have more discussion. Plenty Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So I, so I have a couple of thoughts about this. I, I'm going to step back from the actual case study itself. These are, you know, the, the Powell case and that sort of thing, and talk about a little bit about what happens beforehand. Um, with a case like this, but also the government's response to it afterward. You know, you get enough of these and there's usually some sort of government or provider response as a group, whether it's a hospital or a managed care organization, insurers and the like. Um, and, and two thoughts occur to me. One is that when you hear that it, mistakes do happen, um, and when people in government want to solve those mistakes, the knee-jerk reaction tends to be to over, to legislate something, to regulate something, to make a rule about it and, 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 and implement a rule. Um, and so danger number one is we over-regulate something like this. So I can imagine, for example, uh, a rule that comes out that says you must do informed consent and this is what the informed consent is I and mean, somebody like me in my old days would run off and write the regulation that would be 10 pages long about what informed consent needs to say and it has to be in every provider contract and you have to get the provider to sign everything and it would just be this really big bureaucratic thing that ultimately becomes meaningless because it's just another check the box law. 
So that, that's a problem. And I actually, real story, I, um, so in my life now, um, we represent managed care organizations, we represent provider groups. I was recently looking at a provider contract, a physician's contract, and it, it had this whole section about, as it turns out, informed consent. It went on for pages. Now, the confidentiality section was just a paragraph, and there were other sections that I would expect to see because I, you know, I don't know what the law is in this area. It was like I'm expecting little sections on that and this really long section on informed consent. And I came back to the partner and I said, what's going on? I, I don't get this. I don't, I don't see any legal reason for this. And it turned out this particular group had an issue years and years ago with a particular doc and their answer to it was to then put into every physician's agreement past that point this huge informed <laughs> consent stuff. Um, that for the new practitioners, you know, then it, it, it made sense, but it made sense only from a legal context. That notion of informed consent in the boxes that we were talking about from the, the interest box or the relationship box, that went away. And then it, it just became this, you know, legal thing I have to do. And, and, and that's outside of the comfort zone, you know, in the patient um, and doctor relationship. and and. I think it sort of defeated the purpose of what the group was trying to do. And so, you know, I hope we sort of helped with that. On the other end of it, so that so danger number one is that you overregulate and, and in response to this sort of thing and and the solution kind of becomes meaningless. Um, the second thing that I thought about was this on the on the positive side is the need either in government or for insurers, managed care organizations, provider organizations to look for the opportunities when they are setting up their systems and their contracts and their relationships for that you know, alternative dispute resolution, relationship interest kind of work. Um, so <coughs> here's an example um, of what I mean, and I think it connects to the notion of what the outcomes are. So I recently um, was, uh, we, have, we have a managed care organization in, in Massachusetts um, that does behavioral um, health and substance abuse work. They manage care for behavioral health. And they were approached by a hospital to do discharge planning. The hospital wanted to do these discharge planning sessions and they wanted to invite the managed care organizations into the conversations about the patients um, in you know, one meeting. So let's say we have five patients with behavioral health issues who are gonna be discharged and um, we want to have a telephone meeting. We want the managed care organizations in it because we want to coordinate the care when we discharge them from the hospital. Makes sense, the hospital's on the hook. We don't want readmissions that cost the system money. So they want to coordinate care. The problem was it was more efficient for the hospital to, to have that meeting about all five patients or however many patients at one time. Okay, so far it makes sense. Here's the problem. The problem is patient number one and two belong to our entity. Patient number three and four belong to another managed care entity. Patient number four and five belong to yet another one. Now we have the privacy rules. And the privacy rules say, well, you can't talk about patient one and two with the managed care organization that deals with patient four and five. You can't share that information. And so I was stuck in this bureaucratic world of everybody wants to help this, you know, these patients get discharged appropriately have a conversation about coordinating care, understand what each of the entities has to offer these patients, have a creative conversation, but we have the rules that are gonna keep us from doing that. So what do you do? And we're looking for creative ways um, to, to work around it. You know, we could set up a consent thing, we could do that sort of thing. Um, but it made me step back and think about, well, is there something legislatively, legislatively we can think about um, in the big system picture that would allow this kind of thing to happen in a discharge planning context, where context where it's re clearly related to treatment, um, and and you know how could we do that? And so that could be a government response. It connects here in that it could affect how you know what happens to this patient after, after the care is done. Um, you know, there there it's not just about that particular procedure, but it's also about what other things in the healthcare system are gonna affect this patient, and what are the other opportunities beyond just this procedure that, that you can impact. Um, my last thought, I, I like Susan's thought about like one, one little takeaway, and I was having that same sort of moment as um, the speakers were talking this morning. 
And for me, the moment, um, and, and it crystallized when we started talking about this case, the question for me was, what is the problem we're trying to solve? And I think too often when you get government involved and government tries to respond to an issue, it's not, you know, 535 congressmen, you've got, you know, 535 answers to that question. And so the answer may not necessarily be what you want. And so in this case, I thought, what is the problem that we're trying to solve? If the problem is we don't want this person to have this outcome, as, as Susan and Michael have both said, and we know the practitioners will tell us, that's not possible. Because there are always going to be mistakes. We do not have a perfect system. Accidents happen. Um, and there are all kinds of other issues that go into it. So maybe that's not the problem we're trying to solve. Maybe the problem that we're trying to solve is on the end where we're talking, you know, more carefully to patients, where providers are comfortable doing that and not feeling that that conversation is so legally bound. And every time I say the word, I'm looking at that rights box from um, Deborah's frame this morning. I mean, I'm all in that rights box. That was all me. It's like every job I've ever had has been in that rights box. Um, and, and I think as lawyers, we tend to think that way. And what I've been trying to do in our practice is to bring more of the interest and relationship thought to how we, we craft our contracts, anticipate um, when we're doing it, and this is, this is for the lawyers in the room, anticipating what is this portion of the contract really trying to get at, and is there a way to do it that would improve the quality of care? Because our legal work isn't necessarily separated from the actual provision of care. I think that what I like about this conference is it challenges us to think about the ways that we can get the legal work to marry with quality of care and that you know we work together across disciplines you know to make that happen so that's my thought so a lot to think about and i'm sure we can talk longer but i would love to hear what questions you have jerry robelotti at the back let's start with you yeah, I, the question i had is is if you have a subspecialist who is known as possibly not being uh, uh, the, the top physician in, in, in the field, or the word incompetent was used, which is a very strong word. Uh, what is the responsibility of the referring primary care doctor to his or her patient if that primary care doctor has a suspicion that the physician that I, a specialist that I'm referring my patient to may not be the most competent doctor on the block? Mike, why don't you start with that? Well, I think the only time that a referring doc would send to a known crummy specialist would be in a managed network where he's almost forced to send to that guy. Um, or in the politics of medicine, especially in Connecticut, where there's a lot of competition, the hospital has a certain number of specialists that work there, the primary care people nowadays are probably owned by them, the hospital, um, they're going to send to that person too. Um, I think their responsibility as a physician should be to tell the person, well, this is where you're going to get it done for free or under your insurance with no extra payment because that's in your network that you know uses these people but that guy has a high rate of complications and then maybe provide him with other places say out of network or whatever the reason that was you know making him send to this not very good guy um, so you give the patient the option but it might cost him a lot of out of out of pocket money I mean, theoretically in the credit acts you do no harm if you know that you're potentially putting somebody in harm's way right You've got, a, you've got a moral, as well as I think a professional obligation, to do something different. And if, if because we have people in networks now, is going to make the determination versus the quality of care, right. we've got a big problem. Right. 
Well, I think one of the things that we're talking about today is that very gray area where there might not be an official legal duty that's enforceable, but there is the moral and there's the professional obligation that is often difficult to do within a system. So before moving on to the next question, I was wondering if, Susan, if you had thoughts on this, because I'm, I'm letting this is close, near and dear to your heart. Right. <laughs> um, so I think that, you know, what the basis for your determination or that primary care's determination that this physician is not competent, I mean, that's a pretty scary, pretty mm -hmm. scary thought. Um, because you, one would hope that, in, I know that for our hospital system anyway, that if there are those physicians that have a, shown a trend or something that, you know, like something doesn't seem right, there are many different ways as a hospital system to put checks and balances in place. Perhaps he has um, a mentor who then goes into surgery with him to find out if there is a problem. Um, so I would never hope that a physician would feel bound to refer a patient to someone they knowingly believe is incompetent. Um, is there that scale of who's better? Well, let's look at your graduating class this year. Who's better at this and who's not as good at this? But is it really an untoward risk? I mean, if they have this litigator or this physician versus this physician, there's going to be a confidence interval. Um, and I have yet to meet a primary care physician, to be perfectly honest with you, when I need surgery, who's going to say, this is the surgeon. I'm going to get a list of surgeons, mm -hmm. and I'm going to have to decide. And as a patient myself, I know, technically, I have surgery in a month. There are two surgeons. One is technically probably a tad bit better, but, you, but his bedside manner is terrible. So that if something does go wrong, I want to be able to talk to the one who may not be as technically proficient, but I'm going to be able to have a conversation with him. So that's the, that's, and that's my risk, and that, because I know that, that's my consent process. That's what I know that I'm willing to deal with as a patient. So those are some of the things that at least we consider, I consider, and I assume many of you will be considering at some point in the future. Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Uh, sometimes I think the care that is given, I, I don't know who this is addressed to particularly, but um, the care is decided for you where you come in, uh, you come in as an emergency, you come in via ambulance, and you're given it a certain uh, type of care within the emergency room. You may be sent to ICU, you may be sent to wherever. And so um, patient, neither patient nor family has made any of the decisions as to extended care. Um, at the end of the cycle, whether they come out of the hospital or they die, the family is left with a tremendous bill. I'm, I'm talking about tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands. How, and, and it's now their whole family structure is at stake, their home, um, the collection agencies that are, are, are going after families. Is there any discussion of the social impact of <coughs> decisions that are made which create such a tremendous financial burden? Who wants to take the first stab at that? Actually, I, I, you know, not to put him on the spot, but I think I would look at Damien for um, a little bit of that because of... <laughs> not even up here. We're not even up here. But, and, and here's the reason why, because where you get that, certainly in the government and societal, because you're not going to get that from the health insurer. You're not going to get that from the hospital. They're not going to solve that problem. That problem is going to get solved because as a community or whatever, we all think that that's awful that somebody, you know, a family's left with those kinds of bills and there should be something in the system that keeps that from happening. And so where you, so the places where those conversations happen are in, you know, with the, with the health care advocate. I, I'm in Rhode Island. We have a health care advocate with the, with the attorney general's office. It will happen. Um, you know, in the agencies that run, uh, you know, that uh, we have a health insurance commissioner, for example. We are one of the few states in Rhode Island that does that. Um, the Division of Insurance in Massachusetts. So it will start happening in those places, and that's where the, the, the conversations will start to go. But they're really, it's, 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 it's more of that kind of activism, I think, than I, I – I wouldn't, I don't personally look, and with my old government hat on, I would never look to the hospital systems or the insurers or the providers to fix that. Damien, did you have anything to add to that? Um, that was perfect. I mean, I th the one thing that I was thinking is, is you know, the, the question was that we get a lot of questions from people calling and saying, why should I pay this bill that I've received for whatever service, whether it was expected or not um, and 
one of the key questions we always ask is, well, did you receive that care? Because there's, there's all these different parts to any healthcare delivery. You got the patient, you've got the provider who delivers the care, you've got a payer, hopefully, um, and then the family. And the provider, if they deliver a service, are entitled to receive compensation for that service. When there's a, an outcome like that, if there's medical error that caused that extended stay and all those additional costs for that patient and their family, their estate, then there's a question that uh, Mr. Giordano tackled. Because that might be worth taking out. But it's also a question where some, something like our agency or other advocates in the area that could help get that covered. I, ideally, people are going to have insurance to pay for these costs. So most people don't come out of a hospital with a $300,000 bill unless they've been denied coverage for those services. There's always some payer in most circumstances, especially now that everyone's supposed to have insurance. Some payer is supposed to help offset that, minus deductibles, which can be very burdensome for a lot of people, but it limits it. At some point, there's a limit to how much they're on the hook for. But if they're denied, that's where the question comes in. And we had a, a case last year Twin preemies born. This family had two really, really good plans. Coordination of benefits was all screwed up. No one knew who was supposed to pay first. A year and a half after the fact, all the payments for these children, six months in NICU, were rescinded. And the family got a bill for like one and a half million dollars. Um, because no one had paid. It. it was the secondary, well, anyway. <laughs> we straightened it out. But the average person wouldn't know how to do that. Um, so <coughs> pushing that off when there is a problem getting reimbursement through the normal mechanism onto the hospital system to absorb it, I think should be a last resort. Um, they, as nonprofits, are <coughs> obligated to provide some, well not obligated, but all of them do provide charity care, discounted or free care depending <coughs> on income. Um, so that's an available option. There's other options as well. Um, if they're low enough income, the state can help offset those costs if they're eligible for Medicaid. So th there are options for people that I think should be exhausted first before we start trying to push it on to the providers and the hospital systems who are already seeing reductions. And who provides that service other than your office? I mean, where does a person go who's not <coughs> sophisticated and Let's put it this way. I go talk to people all the time, and six months later, I'll meet someone I had a 20-minute argument with after that first talk, and they have never heard of us. So um, there's not a lot of places where there's direct free advocacy like we offer and like Rhode Island offers. Um, there are healthcare consultants that have established bus businesses that are reasonable, but they charge a percentage, from what I've seen, of the recovery. Uh, and they're hard to find. There's not a lot of them. So, I mean, that's kind of a gap in the market where as more and more of the cost is shifting to the consumers and more expectation of some level of sophistication is expected, once they fall through those cracks and they don't really know where to go next, that's where the gaps are now. Um, and that's what we're trying to fix. Okay. Yes. For Dr. Giordano, how much do you use private mediation and how resistant are the malpractice insurers to that? They're not resistant. Most of the cases will be resolved without going to trial. Uh, if it's a case with a great deal of money at stake and the plaintiff looks like a really good person, they've already sized them up, they will settle the, the, uh, the cases rather than take a risk with the jury. Um, so most of the time, they, they mediate <coughs> out. One of the things that I'd, I'd love, Susan, if you'd be willing to talk a little bit about how you've worked with insurance companies and malpractice carriers to try to incorporate this, or sort of the, either mm -hmm. in the New York hospitals right. or the University of Michigan model. Um, it's exactly as Dr. Giordano said. Very few people want to go to jury trial, at least in New York City for the three years ex ex experience I have. Um, that's the biggest fear because the jury, a lot of times, um, you know, when you can value a case, it's a lot different than a jury valuation um, when you have other types of uh, emotions at play. We, we saw very few people. It's either holding out time-wise, you know, 
you don't go at all, you're not going to settle, and then the t you know it's the clock ticking until you know either someone dies and then they're off the case, or as you said, you'll be quick to resolve it because they want to get things taken care of, um, because it's it's just too too likely if it does go to jury, it'll be much higher, the valuation. So I'd say that people are, especially now, are much more willing to um, have a dialogue and negotiate. The judge directive portion that I was with, with Judge McKeon in New York, it was just, it was another really, I was very fortunate um, in that you could have these dialogues. He's extremely um, talented at bringing people together and saying, well, here's the situation, and getting people to look at it and then come back. It's not that they have to do it in one sitting. It's just that he's really put the pressure on to say, in three months, I want both parties back here. You need to come closer. You know, this is what needs to be done. And he pushes that, and he's very good at it. And there's a big difference in the skill of mediators. Yes. I've seen some really good mm -hmm. ones who are trying to get them together. Mm -hmm. And other ones are just pitching each one side, and you end up with just a standard old-fashioned negotiation. You know, we want $7 million. We'll, we'll, we'll give you 100000 um, 100, You know, and then it's like, are you kidding me? I'll be here all day or for days, you know, and then they, they come up a tiny bit, and <laughs> you go, okay, I'll come down 500 You know, and it's this, anybody could do that, but a really good mediator, it's true. I mean, they really know how to get it together. They point out to each side their own weaknesses mm -hmm. and move them together much, much more quickly. It's important to have a good mediator. Yes, please. We, we do have an apology law in Connecticut, and I just wonder if anybody has ever used it or how, how the fact that we have it, whether it makes a difference. Please. I, I was involved in the case before the apology law, mm -hmm. but we apologize. Uh, there, there was a, Can I say who you are? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm, I'm Steve Wolfson. I'm a oh, cardiologist. Steve. Uh, and one of my patients was one of the uh, three people who died in the cardiac catheterization lab of one of the hospitals. And it was related to a, a system error where uh, instead of oxygen, the, the patients were given anesthesia. Um, uh, uh, the uh, chief of medicine and I went to apologize to the family of the patient who had died. Uh, and um, uh, I didn't do the catheterization myself. One of my partners did. My partner and I went to the wake and apologized again in, 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 in form, informally. The family, uh, I think appropriately, sought legal redress because there had been a major medical er error on the part of the hospital, but uh, stated at the beginning that uh, they were only willing to proceed with this attorney if, uh, if my partner and I were not sued. Wow. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and, and Rock Orlando, the Chief Medical Officer for Hartford Healthcare. So we have a formal policy about transparency and disclosure and apology. That's what we do. If we do something wrong, we, we, we let people know, the family, the patient, as soon as possible. And, and, if, and if we are, uh, are at fault, uh, we, we have set a timeline. We would like to actually offer them financial redress and come to a conclusion, we, and we, we try and do it within 30 days. Uh, and so we're, and, and it's really the Michigan model is really the one that we follow and, and, and believe in that. And it's really, uh, and, and you disclose as you learn more. As a, in all of these adverse events, they unfold over time, and so we have never been disappointed with that approach. How do, the insur how do the insurers, do they play a part in coming up with the money, or is it all from your source? We're the insurer. I run the, uh, I run the captive insurance company for Harvard Health. Okay. <laughs> right, so there are, there are a number of healthcare facilities, healthcare systems, healthcare um, providers that are self-insured. They have a bit more control over the terms by which insurance is provided and the terms by which settlements are negotiated and this kind of thing. So it can happen on a systems level, it can happen on a governmental level. Right now it's happening on the systems level 
more than on the governmental level, and there's still, I think, some confusion about what the governmental level it requires and what the law requires versus the creativity and the, the thinking and the imagination of a healthcare system to be able to structure these kinds of opportunities for conversation, for dialogue. And then, if I may, if I may follow up with you, Rocco, actually, I'm assuming that as part of this, you're also able to take that information back to your system. You get to have that conversation of what happened and be able to go back to your system if there is a system error and fix the system. Every adverse event is an opportunity to not have it happen again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, please. Well, whether it's a, a hospital system or hospital risk management uh, office who's looking at it or whether it's the the insurance company who, who probably has language uh, in their agreements with the persons or entities that they insure that says you can't, uh, you can't settle this without our approval, you, you can't make admissions of, uh, of responsibility with, without our approval um, from the perspective that I see, which is often um, when the cases get to the department of public health because somebody's complained, the smartest thing and most effective thing I've seen is when a hospital or hospital system um, acts very early and very quickly and figures out um, at least as best as they can what went on and who might be responsible and how the thing might be resolved because it's the time that, that uh, the passage of time that often um, makes it more difficult to mediate or do anything later on or more expensive to, to, to do those things. I, I will, I can comment on that. You, as the former health, chief health care regulator for the state of Rhode Island, I was responsible for, among other things, um, having to deal with the hospitals, did, you know, had an adverse uh, event. And um, what you say is absolutely right on from the regulator's perspective, to the extent that the hospital, I mean, they have to, you know, follow our rules anyway, but to the extent that they are being proactive and doing it quickly and, and, and you know, sort of owning up and, and, and that sort of thing, that goes a long way with the regulator. So just to, as a point to the, you know, the hospital administrators out there, at least that's true in Rhode Island. Susan, did you want to add to that? I did, that? What you're speaking to is so critical because right now, I mean, it's who gets to the patient first, who explains first, and who's the duty. When you're the surgeon walking out of the operating room, you have the family right there, and it's in that moment. But to offer that surgeon the support because of an untoward outcome, either his, his error or not his error, um, as a hospital system, you have to be able to be there too. There are those physicians that don't want the hospital system there, or the hospital system itself may not be there. That's the physician's responsibility. I think there's still a lot of work to be done into the timing and to coming together quickly um, because either side or either part of, of this is, is really <coughs> important mm -hmm. as to how it rolls and the, and out. There's a lot of pieces in between. And That's like, right. And, some, and instincts aren't always so good or are not uh, as, uh, as um, coordinated throughout. So things where um, uh, uh, things that might have gone better um, can go terribly badly. Uh, Mike, uh, like, yep. I would like to comment on this too. Um, DPH, inve their investigations, I'm amazed at how thorough they are. Um, but the reason that they end up coming to us too is I have a case now. We've got a case. Both parents are doctors. They hate plaintiff's lawyers. Their daughter, 16, was admitted to a place not in this state um, for suicidal thoughts, and she had had them for a long time, a lot of problems. And she kills her, herself, or she ends up, you know, brain, brain dead enough where she ends up dying um, in this place, which is a place that treats that specifically. Mm -hmm. And the DPH had already looked at this and all kinds of errors. At the end of the day, just a slap on the wrist, you know, nothing happens. So these parents who absolutely don't want to sue people, they don't need money, they just want to change policy, end up coming to a plaintiff's firm. I don't know the answer, you know, what the state can do or an insurance company, but there's really nothing happens, you know, nothing significant enough happens to that place that 
might change their behavior or the way they do business. So then they end up in the old civil litigation, three years of pain kind of a thing, you know, and I, I don't know the answer, but their specific problem with the whole thing was nothing happened. You know, they got a slap on the arrest. They were told, and the investigation was terrific. They were told, you know, what they could do better, you know, what's their corrective action, they have to document it. it it's all great. And it's really great for plaintiff's lawyer because half of the case has already been researched for you. But, I mean, nothing happens, you know. And so then these people are forced to come to the civil system to try to change policy through a bunch of money. And these parents already, if, if they get money on this, which I think they will, they want to set up a, scho a scholarship in the name of their daughter. And they're very nice people. They don't want the place closed down. It's been there since, you know, for over a hundred and. 50 years, you know, and, uh, you know, it serves a, a function, you know, so they're really kind of interesting plaintiffs. But a anyway, just a comment, you know, we, we don't have anything that the state seems to really do to make these places change. Other questions? Yes, please. Yeah, I mean, just one of the things that Michael said earlier was that if something is identified as a risk of a procedure, it's almost impossible to get compensation. I just had a colonoscopy a couple of days ago and it's hard to imagine um, anything that happened to me that wasn't listed in the information. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, what uh, are you advocating some kind of a uh, like a workers comp type of situation that just Compensates for those those things that I, might happen to you. I don't know since Jennifer said this, you know, and I've been racking my brain. You know, what's a good system for a case like like this, where it ends up, you know, this is not going to be a mad mal case, but this person owes tons of money. If there was a cost share hospital, you know, has to cost share some of this care, which then is going to put some pressure on the insurance company, you know, it becomes about money, but sometimes money might change the policy. You know, we're, now we're going to screen the docs a heck of a lot closer. I mean, we're still in a no-fall in insurance in, in medicine. You know, you have lots of car accidents, it costs you the same. No, you, you pay more. But in medicine, it's still no fault, and then the risk is shared amongst the whole pool of those type of specialists, say neurosurgery being one of the higher cost, higher risk things. I don't know, maybe a cost share back on. See, I, I see it's, it's interesting because it, once you take out the sort of kind of incompetent doctor from that case study, then what you have is, you know, a patient who has a procedure who's in that 0.01% or 0.08% right. where it's, you know, there's the chance it's going to go wrong and we told them and, you know, that's that's that. And it's so, I'm, I'm, it, it's hard to believe that the healthcare system somehow would want to take on, you know, to, to share that, that risk absent, you know, again, some government you know, some government tell, right. government director telling them to do that. But, right. um, well, the, yeah, that, that, anyway. I, uh, I, I'm not as sanguine as are you, Michael, uh, about the fact that suits don't get launched for acknowledged uh, writ, risks that are in the consent form. Uh, suits are launched and uh, they're, they're pursued sufficiently to be a nuisance. So yeah, this, uh, yeah. I, I'm. I, I have the luxury of working at a very experienced firm that yeah. doesn't take yeah. that kind of stuff. Don't do that. No, and and it's uh, just not just worth to, it. Just <laughs> <laughs> hey, I've been there. Thank you, Jesus, but there are good and bad lawyers as well. <gasps> no. <laughs> yeah, but this symposium is not about that. <laughs> <laughs> the, the other problem is that we deal with a fragmented and chaotic healthcare system. I don't think that primary care physicians anymore know who is good and who is bad. They don't go to the hospital anymore. You're right. They oh, sit in their offices and see patients. So uh, when when I have needed to have surgery, 
I have called some of my nurses in the uh, nurse friends in the operating room to ask who's doing good surgery. Yes. <laughs> it's the only way I know of to That's do great. it. <laughs> That's the way to go. Thanks, it was a great tip. Everybody should make friends with emergency room nurses. So fabulous people to check, you know, your screening on Facebook and things like that. I do want to provide one last, hopefully, um, thought-provoking comment in response to Peter's question. What do we do with that one patient? What do we do in that situation where we have people who are leaving hospitals where there is currently no situation that the healthcare system can take, can take under its wing and fix, right? We have a tremendous number of patients for whom the healthcare system can't make their lives whole because there are a tremendous number of social determinants of health that are frankly far beyond the control of a healthcare system. This is one place where I had a really wonderful, exciting conversation uh, with Dr. Clark's chapter after his conver this conversation this morning. This may be one place where lawyers can start to come along, healthcare providers, not as adversaries, but as colleagues for patient treatment. And situations where we have these new models of reimbursement that thoughtfully incentivizes <coughs> keeping people healthier longer in a way we haven't experimented with or played with much recently. To the extent that the social determinants of health, things like housing, things like employment, things like nutrition, air quality, water quality, your ability to exercise, your ability to access education, all of those play a significant role in anyone's ability to bounce back after a $10,000 medical bill. There is more to this when we're dealing with an overall understanding of health that lawyers can play a critical role in making sure that people's environment, <coughs> people's homes, people's lives are better and more able to be navigated when the healthcare system is not the solution to it. And I think one of the things that lawyers have often neglected, and I think this is one of the ways where we're seeing healthcare moving, they have been forcing physicians to start thinking beyond the individual patient. Lawyers, too, likely, or at least potentially, could start looking beyond the individual client and be thinking in terms of a community, be thinking in terms of a system, be thinking beyond the simple legal issue that comes in, that someone has articulated, but rather say, you know what, I don't think you have a malpractice claim here, but I'm I think some of this might have happened because your housing substandard. And the reason why you ended up there in the first place was because you were triggered into crisis because of the mold in your house that your landlord won't remediate. And if we can get your landlord to do that, then maybe this is the last time you end up encountering the healthcare system in this capacity. And maybe we can start improving the care of our society so that healthcare can truly focus on healthcare, where that is the only tool that can fix it. But right now, we have such a gap between the number of unmet legal needs and the number of lawyers able and capable of providing that health care or providing that counsel that trying to come up with creative and imaginative ways to start closing that gap in a way that I think health care and society and policy has been doing for probably the last 10 years actively and um, enthusiastically more often than not. Anyway, I want you to help, help me thank our panelists.